made a, an adventurous trip down from Penn State uh, to come see us here. Um, I hope he's had an exciting day visiting with all the faculty here. Um, I, I'm extremely happy to have him here. Um, if, if you want to, those of you who are wanting to become successful faculty, I suggest looking at Professor Holmes' website. So he's been at Penn State for uh, eight years now. So yeah, he's yeah, a yeah. full professor there. In 2012, he became full professor. I did this year. This year. Okay. So this year became yeah. full professor. So a nice, quick, direct path. Um, during his time at Penn State, he's had, I counted, 27 covers. Um, well over 100 uh, publications from his group. Um, and maybe even more interesting to me, anyway, the diversity of work and the clever nature of how he looks at systems and, and microfluidic devices, I think it's an incredible everything from. Uh, and I, it's always great when you can make up new words, right? So acoustofluidics, plasmal fluidics, um, two kind of concepts. We have this field of optofluidics, and now Professor Huang has his own little subdivisions shooting off there, which is exciting, and I think people will be following him along that path. Um, so he's done a lot of great work there. Um, Graduated from UCLA in 2005. Yeah. Um, PhD there um, from, I want to make sure I, I have this right, from Chiming Ho's group. Yeah. Um, so this group has produced a, a lot of great people um, and we've gone on to many other great places. Um, so the list of, of colleagues that he has around the country is also uh, quite impressive. He's now won a number of awards, the one I'll highlight, um, which I think is maybe the, the most uh, significant and competitive is in 2012 we won the NIH uh, Director's New Innovator Award, so that's a very good award to get. Um, and in looking at his work, I think you'll see why. So, thank you for coming to see us, Professor Wong. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor White, for such a nice introduction. We talk about, you know, not. I really feel like are you really talking about me or talking about somebody else? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, it's actually an honor and also. Humbling to come to uh, uh, University of Maryland because I I know you guys have great academics and uh, great uh, research and uh, especially in the microsystems and microfluidics uh, field and I, I, I personally have read a lot of papers from you know faculty members and students from here and so it's it's good to come here uh, actually physically and uh, meet people here so it's, it's it's great to be here so today I'm going to share with you our work on um, microfluidics. Specifically, in the past, uh, since I joined Penn State, we have been working a lot on um, integrating acoustics and optics with microfluidics. So I'm going to talk, talk uh, about our work on acoustic optofluidics. Uh, basically, means integration of acoustics and optics with microfluidics. Before I share with you our work on acoustic optofluidics, I would like to use a fine example to explain. What is a crystal auto fluidics? When I was a college student, I was a big soccer fan. And one of my favorite soccer team was the Brazilian national team. And one of my favorite Brazilian players was Roberto Carlos. He's extremely good in doing free kick, especially bandit free kick. So now I'm going to show you a bandit free kick he did in a match between a Brazilian national team and a French national team. So Roberto took the soccer ball on the field. And he ran, and he kicked. You can see the ball was going out, and then curving. You can watch it again. <laughs> so it's it's, uh, it's pass impossible for like. Microfluidics people like myself or my students do such a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to figure out what can we do, right? So this this is a microfluidic ch uh, a chip that tries to mimic what's going on on this soccer uh, field. <laughs> and this is what a droplet that represents uh, a soccer ball. And this triangle represents a Brazilian player. This circle represents a French player. And this is a transducer to drive this water droplet. And uh, so we can see. So we drag this. And <laughs> I call this a fine example of a crystal optofluidics because obviously there's a water job that there's a microfluidic component. There is a, a transducer though, so there's acoustics. 
and you also we 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 uh, we shine light on it so we can see. So there's also optics, and this is a fun example, and uh, it's uh, it really I think it illustrates actually in microfluidic environment if we do uh, uh, good engineering we can pr uh, precisely control fluidity, uh, uh, you know, very very precisely. Uh, it's fun, but it's not particularly useful. So what I'm going to do today is to show you some examples de developed by my uh, students and also postdocs, which in my, in my opinion, not only fun, but also uh, quite useful. And uh, I, my specialty was fluid mechanics. Uh, and I, so I was, I got all my degrees in mechanical engineering, so I, I started fluid mechanics and heat transfer. And so, so, so we know a little bit about microfluidics. And when I joined, the, I started the group um, in 2005, come to Penn State, I you know, tried to think, you know, there are a lot of uh, great researchers in microfluidics. How can I uh, do something different? You know, at that time, uh, we also have, my group also have, uh, you know, accumulated some expertise in acoustics and, and the optics. We figured if we, you know, integrate these different different kind of physics together. We can actually do a lot of unique things. Uh, that we can do a lot of things that are like you know pure. If you only control fluid, it would be difficult to do. So over the last few years, we really have been working on acoustic fluidics and opto fluidics. And um, and so I'm going to share with you our work on that. And I will first start with our work on acoustic tweezers. Basically, we use surface acoustic wave to manipulate spills for other uh, particles. And we realize, so we call acoustic tweezers, and this work was inspired from uh, optical tweezers. And as you, as you probably know, optical tweezers actually is the gold standard way to do uh, manipulation. And uh, it's a very, very powerful tool. Really, uh, it was invented by St uh, you know, Stephen Cho, uh, uh, the former uh, secretary of, of energy, and uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it works great. Uh, you know, really has has impacted a lot of research uh, in life sciences in biomedicine. Uh, however, it has two major drawbacks. Number one, the system is always is bulky, is expensive, and it's difficult to maintain. Number two is. Optical tweezers require high intensity laser. Uh, you have to shine high intensity laser, uh, focus light on the, the objects you want to, you want to manipulate. And uh, to trap it, to manipulate it. And that process itself damages you know, the bioparticles, especially if you want to do it for a long uh, period of time. And that's a, that's a big problem because if you want to do something about it, you, want to, you don't want the, the process itself affect the, the cell function, affect the cell integrity. So that's why uh, over the years we think um, we need to develop something uh, different, something uh, uh, potentially can serve as alternative uh, to, uh, to uh, in perhaps in some applications we can replace optical tweezers. So, so that's why we have turned to uh, surface acoustic wave and we call our work acoustic tweezers Surface acoustic wave are basically an acoustic wave that propagate on the surface of elastic materials. And you can uh, generate surface acoustic wave when you apply voltage on interdigital transducers on piezoelectric substrate. You can also detect surface acoustic wave uh, um, using interdigital transducers IDTs. There are two things about surface acoustic wave that really get us excited about about this. Number one is surface acoustic wave or saw devices is very compact and inexpensive. Why do I say that? So a lot of compact electronics such as cell phones have saw devices. And these saw devices only occupy a very small portion of cell phone body. And that tells three things. Number one, the saw devices itself is very compact and inexpensive. And number two, Accessories needed to drive store devices can be very compact and inexpensive. Number three, store devices can be very energy efficient because you can power your cell phone by batteries. And uh, so, 
So we think that's actually perfect for lab on chip for microfluidics. If we use that to, you know, to do those lab on chip functions, and uh, we can count on it that the, the solid you know, the system we develop will be very compact and inexpensive, and also energy efficient. So that's first advantage. Second advantage, the acoustic power intensity we use, the frequency we use, is very similar to that of ultrasonic imaging, which we know for half a century is very, very non-invasive, it's very bi-compatible. And um, so, I mean, today when I made, I, I made a lot of family members, I was trying to show off my son. I, you know, I, I, I became a proud dad last year, and I was very excited. Whenever I get a chance, I, I, I mean, whenever I, the family members, they like to, I always like to talk about my research, but once I have my son, I just, I, I like to take about it. <laughs> So, so when my wife was pregnant, right? So you know, and uh, I, I took my wife to see doctors. What do doctors use? They use ultrasound to do imaging. Right? And we never see doctors using uh, X-ray, using a big electrode or magnet or or big laser. Right? That, and it, that, to some extent, tells you if you do ultrasound correctly, it can be very, very uh, safe technology. Because when doctors using that. Half of the, basically half of the population in the world has used that technology for half a century, and nobody ever talked about any side effect. It's, it's a non fact. When the doctors using ultrasound on my wife's body, I, never, I don't care. When the doctors using six minutes or ten minutes or now, I don't care. I know it's very very safe. And uh, so, if we use similar acoustic power intensity, similar frequency to to do to, to do something else on biological cells, I, I think we can. I, I think it's it's safe to say that. Most likely, this, the cells can be happy, can can retain the natural undisturbed states. Right? So that's that's the second advantage: uh, non-invasiveness by compatibility. So that's why we have been working on this in the past few years. We have been working on this acoustic treatment, and we are very excited about it. And we realize many functions. And I'm going to talk about uh, the first function first: the tiny biological cells. So now. The gold standard way to pattern biological cells, you, you will do. They create a pattern of chemicals, and the cells will stick to their chemicals. So by creating a pattern of chemicals, you can create a pattern of, of biological cells. Works way. And however, uh, is a few things, uh, drawbacks. Number one is, is this process uh, it, it usually works for one type of cell. Right? So if you want to use this patterning technique to pattern another type of cells, you need to develop different kind of chemistry, different kind of chemicals. Right? That's problem number one. Number two is this patterning technique is not tunable. So for example, once you create this pattern, if you want to turn off the pattern, you can't. If you want to change the pattern, you can. You cannot. Right? So that's those are the problems. So we are using a course way we hopefully we can we can we can address that problem. And the the mechanism is actually quite straightforward. We have two pairs of interdigital transducers, IDTs. Uh, each one of them can emit surface push wave. So this one will emit surface push wave. This one also emits surface push wave. So these two surface acoustic waves will meet each other, they will interfere, and will form standing surface acoustic wave. So there will be periodical distribution of pressure nodes, which is the lowest pressure points. And, uh, and uh, so the biological cells will tend to migrate to the Pressure nodes. So by forming periodical distribution of pressure nodes, we can form periodical distribution of biological cells. So that's the working schematic of the working mechanism. And we first did some simulation. We know we can form one-dimensional or two-dimensional uh, periodical distribution of pressure nodes. And this is our our device. Very simple device. We I only want our students to work on simple devices. Uh, and uh, and so the device is basically one. PDMA's polymer layer coated on a, a IDT a substrate. And you can see this results. When the surface of course wave saw is off, the particles are randomly distributed. When the saw is on, we can form one dimensional pattern or two dimensional pattern. We can we can turn the pattern on or off. We can also change the pattern. So this is patterning of fluorescent beads. We also uh, create a pattern of biological cells. So this one will create a pattern of over the beta cells, this one we create a pattern of E. coli cells. So these two different cells have very, very different uh, 
size and different shapes. This one, the diameter is about seven to eight micron. This one, diameter about one micron. And this one is spherical shape. This one is elongated shape. So by demonstrating, we can pattern these two different kind of uh, biological cells. We are confident we can pretty much pattern or manipulate any kind of uh, biological cells. So that's first function. Second function is to we use exclusive treaters to do label free cell separation. As of today, the gold standard way to do label free cell separation is centrifugation. It works great. Any biochemistry lab or lab, lab, labs in the life sciences or biomedicine go there, you will see a lot of centrifuges. Works great, however, it has one big drawback it could damage cells. And because most people, after they do centrifugation, they want to use the cells. They want to collect it, they do something about it. If it damages cells, then the, the kind of study you do is not that minimal. So at some point, I had a long one-hour argument with a scientist who, who actually came from centrifug centrifuge manufacturing company. He said centrifugation does not damage cells as it does. So, I was so tired of the, the argument because I'm terrible with arguing with each other. I try to avoid conflict and argument as much as I can. So in the end, I was asking him, what kind of parameters do you use? He told me 3,000 RPM for 20 minutes. I said, if you put me in situ at 3,000 RPM for 20 minutes, I would be dead. And how can you say that even though I'm dead, there's no damage <laughs> on my body at the molecular level, or cellular level. So we, we, uh, I was very happy we ended the conversation with you. <laughs> so, but the point is, we need to develop some alternative approaches, uh, you know, uh, especially applications where preserving cell function integrity is important. I have a question. Yes? What's the smallest thing that you can have with the pressure? Can you use it at the molecular level or does it have particle something? So, for example, if you look at this, right? Like, yeah. uh, this part, actually, this uh, fluorescent but B is the, the size is about 500 to 800 nanometers. But we also, there I have slides to show, we can also manipulate uh, liquid crystal, uh, which is like three to five nanometer, right? So, so I think, I think, I, I think we can, if we can, we probably, we should be comfortable manipulating uh, things, uh, you know, in the 50, a hundred nanometer size, like viruses, that, that. Below that, uh, we have to, I think it's still feasible, but we have to use some other mechanisms. Yeah. So that, that's the, I'm, I'm talking about the mechanism. So the, how we can separate different particles with different sizes or, or different density, and when the particles with different size or cells, with different sizes or different density, flow into this surface of the wave region, and the bigger particles, they will experience larger force, just like you know, the force is proportional to the volume. And then they will migrate to the pressure nodes faster. And the small particles, they will migrate slower because the force, the experience is slower, is smaller. So the bigger particles will move faster, they will be, you know, they will be collected in the middle channel. The small particles, I mean, they will move slower, so it will be collected to two side channels. And that's confirmed by our experimental results. The green particles are bigger, they will be collected in the middle channel, and the small, the red particles are smaller, they will be collected by the two side channels. And uh, so that's the, uh, that's the separation of, yes, sorry. Uh, How does the throughput compare with DEP in the acoustic? Oh, okay, the throughput is, uh, is definitely a lot higher than DEP, because uh, the force can be uh, much larger. And the throughput we have right now is about 40, 40 uh, microliter uh, per minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, That's the, the one we have right now. But our target is to make this at least one milliliter per minute, or even 10 milliliter or 50 milliliter per minute. Uh, it's feasible because our mechanism actually is not, we, we achieve this, not because of microfluidics, it's because of surface wave. And we actually, our next step is to do something beyond micro, we, we actually can possibly using millimeter size channel. 
if we do diagnostics, right, I think for, for this kind of people, or even much smaller is, is sufficient because all you need to do is to detect, to do, do detection. But if we want to use this for therapeutic purpose, right, for example, we want to produce blood pro products like platelets, white blood cells, using this, you need high quantity. Because what they have, for one unit of blood is 500 milliliters. That's, that's a lot of blood. Right? So it's almost one liter of blood. And uh, you need to process that. And there are a lot of needs for that. So we are working on it. But I, 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 I'm, I think it's feasible. Because yeah. uh, we just need to do some small twists on our design. So that's the, that's the separation of particles. We also work on separation of biological cells. For this one, work, we show that we can separate cancer cells from from, from blood cells, because cancer cells are tend to be bigger. And, uh, and uh, we also separate, we are also, also working on separate, uh, separation of circulating tumor cells from blood cells. So CTC, circulating tumor cells, something very difficult to separate because the number of CTC is very, very rare. You only have one CTC out of one billion blood cells. Uh, so to separate them is very, very challenging. Uh, and there are a lot of good techniques that can do it, but our niche is we can do it without affecting the, uh, the, the CTC function. Because since the CTC is so real, so precious, once you separate them, isolate them, you want to do something about it. But if the process affects the CTC function, then all your efforts has been wasted. So here, we have not been able, we have our space, we have not get to the clinic sample yet, because our technology at this stage is not ready, but we are working on it. So you can see in the beginning, this is the circulating tumor cell, uh, you know, the, the red is that, that circulating tumor cell. You can see after this selection, this, in this outlet, we collect almost everything is, is the you know, you know, tumor cells because, because our technique can achieve very, very high uh, precision. And also, uh, this, the high purity is almost 98, 99%. And um, so that's the separation, that's the, uh, that's the label free separation. Uh, label free se separation works great in some applications. If the mechanical biomarker, for example, size is a good biomarker, it works great. For example, if you know the two components have very, very different size difference, for example, platelets versus blood cells, then, then it's a very good technique because you don't need to add any label. It's, it's, it's fantastic. But in a lot of times, uh, size is, uh, is not a good biomarker. Itself is not sufficient. So a lot of times you need chemical biomarkers to separate them. So that's why we are also working on using that to do fluorescence activated cells work, uh, FACTS. So FACTS is a, is a very important tool in, in life sciences, in biomedicine. Uh, the market for this is a few, uh, you know, uh, three to four billion dollars a year. And it's not only very useful for, for, uh, for, uh, um, for the research purpose, but also very powerful for uh, medical uh, diagnostics. For example, uh, FACTS is the gold standard way to, uh, to monitor CD, CD4 uh, cell level, which is the way to monitor uh, you know, HIV, right? So, and how FACTS works, you basically flow uh, cells into an inner tube of a coaxial tube, and you have a sheet flow to squeeze the cells. So that, so that each, when the squeezing is strong enough, the, the cell will pass. Will basically will be, will be forced to line up one by one. And uh, so you will shine laser on it and you detect different kind of signal for reasons for the scatter, side scatter. So it's a high throughput uh, cell characterization uh, and sorting technique. So once you detect them and you, you apply voltage over electric plates and you diffract them into different outlets. So that's the working mechanism. And this is high throughput single cell characterization and the sorting technique works great. However, it has a few problems. Number one, it's very expensive, and also it has big biosafety concerns. Uh, uh, you can see all the cracks, the cell sorted, actually are housed in a biosafety group because it's, the sorting is performed in air, it generates aerosol, and, and that is bad for the operators. But those are not the two problems that I talk about. Actually, I'm only focused on one particular problem. The, the current facts has very, it has, has 
it is very bad in terms of preserving cell integrity. A lot of people are talking about the facts, they're talking about, they only talk about this part, doing analysis. But here I'm talking about, you not only do the analysis, but also you do sorting. So if you really need to do sorting, the ability to <coughs> preserve cell function is very, very important. Because if you cannot preserve your cell function, why do you sort it? And uh, the reason why they cannot preserve cell integrity is because the shear pressure used to squeeze the biological cell is very, very high. It's a, you know, 70 PSI. And also the voltage applied is very high, 6,000, 12,000 volt. Now plus one will be in that kind of environment. And the impact force is also very high. So it's been reported that uh, for a lot of fragile sensitive cells, such as neurons, stem cells, dendritic cells, or liver cells, or those fragile cells, you just, it's hopeless. You cannot use facts to sort them. Because it, it's family. Okay, the cells are dead okay, after the sorting. That's not good. Not only that, but also, even for very, very low, there's, so this aspect has people have talked have talk about it. But there's another aspect people totally ignore it. Is that the, the facts process, the sorting process, changed gene expression. I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, this, it's okay for us to ignore it. Okay. Because, but now, we cannot afford to ignore it. Because genomics, protomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, I have difficulty to pronounce all these words. But all these omics <laughs> become very important. Right, if you work on this omics and if your technique itself disturb this gene expression, again, this kind of study you do is meaningless. And and this, uh, uh, we actually did some experiments before, for example, for malaria-infected red blood cells. We found that 50% of this messenger RNA has been disturbed. And but people don't re don't pass this this results. We uh, there are two different reasons. Number one, doing these experiments. Very expensive. We did that experiments once, cost me three thousand dollars. Number two is these these are negative results. Right? If we report it, it doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do anybody else any good. So people don't talk about this. But that's not that's not good. Okay. And uh, and the gene expression change is the problem is not only applied to these fragile cells, but also applied to almost any cells. Uh, for example, we did a study on HeLa cells, which is a very, very robust cells. Cancer is very, very robust. Even we, we do that, we found that 13 genes are changed. So, 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 that's, so we think we have to develop something better. And if we can develop something better, we talk about it, people start to buy it. And uh, people realize that we need to set new standard. We need to uh, have something better. So what we are doing, we are not, we are using surface and force wave to replace hydrodynamic force to focus it. We are also using surface and force wave. We are not using electric plate, high voltage, 12,000 volts. We are using surface and force wave to, so, to deflect it. And uh, we are sorting everything in fluid. We are not sorting it in air. So then the impact force also be less. So what I'm saying is we replace these two mechanisms and at the same throughput, we can, we require much less pressure, 20 times less pressure, and 1,000 times less voltage. So then in that case, you can imagine, we can, we can preserve the cell function a lot better. So that's, first we need to demonstrate, we can actually focus cells. This work shows that when we apply boost wave, when they generate pressure nodes, all their biological cells, they should go to the pressure nodes, and that's as confirmed from the results, when the cool square is off, the particles are randomly distributed. When the cool square is on, all the pressure, all the particles will go to the middle. Right? That's, the, that's the top view. We also put a prism beside the microfluidic channel. We take an image from the side. You can see that's before the cool square is on, after the cool square is on. So from this, we know that they are focused not only in y direction, but also in z direction as well. So then we can make sure each individual cell will pass the detection point one by one. And this is our video. We cannot present a microfluidic presentation without a video. <laughs> that, that's, that's, this is not right. <laughs> okay, that, that's you. When they're on and off, they're, they're focused or defocused. Right? 
So this is a, this is, once we demonstrate focusing, we cover that with, up, with optics to detect it, and we shine light. The one optic fiber to shine light, and then three optic fibers to detect uh, uh, signals. Uh, we detect three different kind of signals, forward scatter, side scatter, and, and choresis. You can see this. This is a, this is a, you know, we can see very nice peaks, uh, very uniform peaks. And there's one point here, very important, uh, coefficient of variation. And the lower the better, it tells the resolution of, of your technique. Ours, for fluorescence, is about 5%. It's very close to the commercial one without doing any hydrodynamic focusing. And our throughput is about 4,000 particles of cells per second, which, again, is, is getting very close uh, you know, to a commercial system. And this is the comparison uh, of this daily data. But what I'm saying is that, that this, we also detect cells, and our result is similar to that of uh, commercial one. And, uh, and we achieve this without using sheet flow. So without using sheet flow, that there are a few advantages. We make the system a lot smaller and cheaper. And uh, also create much less biohazards. Because what is sheet flow? Yeah. I mean, one equipment on average will consume five liters of sheet flow a day. Uh, and uh, you, 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 it's, so it's more environment friendly uh, approach. And also, most importantly, you can preserve the cell function. So after we achieve this uh, focusing and detection, we also do uh, sorting. Uh, so the, how you do, when, once we change the frequency or we change the phase of the cost plate, you can, we can change the position of the pressure nodes, therefore we can also change the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, position of the cells because the cells will go to the pressure nodes. So we can sort them into other one, two, three, four, five, right? We're using a cost plate. So this is, we also achieve, the, you know, manipulation of, we pick one, one particles out in the flow from others. So we can achieve either Still sorting or, or job and sorting with um, and uh, and so that's the, so far I talk about uh, patterning cells. We talk about label free separation of cells. We also talk about fluorescence activated cell sorting. But they are all dealing with you know biological cells that are micrometer size. We also want to know can we do something nanometer scale, smaller? Size. So uh, uh, the answer is yes. So here what we do when we apply uh, we're using that to manipulate, uh, you know, liquid crystals, which diameter about three to five nanometer. When we apply a boost wave, uh, when we turn it on or off, we can align or de-align liquid crystal. And when they are aligned, they will turn from opaque to transparent. And once they are turned from trans transparent, uh, then uh, we actually write four characters, P, D, L, C, and the name, the liquid crystal film. And when they are opaque, you cannot see. But once we apply a boost wave, you can. It become transparent so you can see. So this uh, approach can possibly use it as a smart window or that kind of application. And we, so this is manipulation of organic nanomaterials. We can also manipulate new organic nanomaterials such as um, nanowire. And this work we show that when we, once we apply surface of wave, we can align these nanowires and we can uh, form one dimensional pattern or two dimensional pattern. We can also change the pattern. So that's the that's the manipulation of nano objects. So, so we call our work a cross tweezers. I really believe that a, a basic function of a tweezer should be able to track a single particle and to move it along any route you want it to move. At that time, I was not. We, we did not have that function. So I told one of my students, I said, if you demonstrate this, how they should graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's one way for me to motivate my students. So today we actually talk about the faculty members like, like to talk about how can we motivate our students. It's something. It's a topic we never get tired of. <laughs> so that's a uh, you know the mechanism actually is quite uh, straightforward. We have two pairs of interdigital transducer IDTs. So he said, we use chirp LEDs, so they can resonate over a wide range of frequency. And once we change the frequency, we change the position of friction nodes, we can change the position of cells. So we have two pairs of LEDs. One can control movement along x-axis, the other one control y-axis. Right. So, so we, what we did is, we put a, we put a, you know, the biological cells into this microfluidic channel, 
and we trap this single particle, and we move it. And I come from the Pennsylvania State <laughs> University, PSU. We are proud of our university, so we write PSU. <laughs> we also we also write something more complex, <laughs> and that was the journal we submitted our paper, and uh, was declined. <laughs> so we changed one figure and submitted <laughs> So here, we will write PNA as well write nature. I mean, not only we want to showcase to, to please the editor, we also have something more profound meaning. Right? So for example, we write P PSU, we only need either move along X axis or Y axis. But when we write PNA as well nature, we have to write along TRT lines. So that's, 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 that's more the purpose of, of, of doing this. Uh, and that's, so that's the manipulation of single cell. But then people ask us, why is it useful to manipulate single single? Uh, the answer is actually not too useful. And, but the thing is, the good thing about working in academia, you don't have to work on things useful. As we can, I mean, we, we do things because it's fun. So I think that's, that should be the bigger motivation. But then, things fun can also, at some point, can turn into something useful. The ability to make a single cell may not be useful, but if you can make many cells, it can be useful. So here, we are showing that we can precisely control the distance between two cells. See, that can become very useful. See, we are, we are bringing two particles together, and uh, we can control the distance uh, you know, from, from tens of micron to Three micron, to one micron, to zero micron, right? and you can see this will show that when the two uh, cells are in contact with each other, literally the distance is zero micron. You can see dye transport between these two cells. So the, the dyes in this cell will be transferred to this one. But when the distance is three micron, if you keep that distance, there is no dye transport. So this book shows, hey, we can actually very precisely control that. So we can form, we can form. Uh, cell pair, we can also form, we can form a, a cell chain, a longer cell chain, also we can form, we can form two-dimensional organi uh, cell organization or three-dimensional organization. Then it really, uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool because especially for people who study cell cell communication, you really need to precisely control the cell environment. And cell cell communication basically is very, very important vital for a lot of physiological and pathological processes such as cancer, uh, diabetes, and uh, immunological uh, uh, interactions. To understand these disease models, we need to control cell cell communication. We need to probe it, we need to understand how they talk to each other. Right? And, but to do that, you need to control the cell environment. You need to control how many cells, what's the distance between cells, what's the cell type, and, are they, and how cells are organized. Either, you know, like triangle or is a chain, or is two-dimensional, three-dimensional? Are they in, in, sus in suspension or are they in contact? So all these, again, I think, I really think now is a good time for engineers, for physicists, to get into biogenetics. Because I think many years ago, engineering actually was a bad word in an age. Not anymore. Because the biologists and, 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 and the MDs realized they cannot do it alone by themselves. Because all the techniques that have been used is the same technique they used 50 years ago. You know, the grandpa used. Right? And, uh, <laughs> and, and if, I, if they want to discover something new, they need to rely on engineers or physicists to, to provide them something different, something better, so that they can discover something their grandpa did not know. So, so, so that's why I think I think, I think we, we should, and also now they are a lot more uh, receptive to, it, to, to us. They, they want to work with us. So the tool we have right now is we can, we are still working on it, but our real passion is to create cell assembly with prescribed cell number, cell cell distance, cell organization, and cell type. We want to have everything very precisely controlled. And to do that, it will be impact cell, uh, cell, cell communication, tissue engineering, system biology. And the, uh, the good thing about ours, we can achieve high precision, high throughput simultaneously. We also can achieve this without affecting the cell 
property and still function, still integrity. So, so I will talk about maintaining of biological sales, we'll talk about manipulation of nano, yes? Sorry, before you go on. Um, so you've talked a lot about and shown a lot of XY control. Yeah. Can you design something that will push the cell up off the surface by even a short distance and just let it hang there? We, we can, we can, uh, we can. Uh, but I have to say that controlling in Z direction uh, is something we, we, we are, it's more challenging, but we already have some preliminary results. We, we understand a little bit better than a few years ago in terms of how cells migrate on Z direction, and it's very, very important, because if you want to do it in tissue engineering, we have to do three-dimensional manipulation, and uh, that's something my group, quite a few smart people are working on that right now. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If they did, they, they, they would graduate. <laughs> so the, the, the reason I ask is, is uh, one of the challenges that a, a number of people I know have is that they want to study a particular cell, and yes. once it attaches to a surface, it's phenotype change. Yes. And they want it to study, they want to be able to study it while it's suspended for a long period of time. And yeah. They keep being aggravated because they're trying to watch, trying to watch, and then it attaches and changes. Yeah. So, so actually, the, the good thing about what we are doing right now is we actually all these two, all this stuff actually has suspension, suspended cells. So we can now actually there is, as far as I know, there is no technique that can have this kind of problem, you know, precise control when the cells in suspension. Okay, we can do suspension, but once we turn the post wave off, the cells also with with slowly drop. So we can we can do suspension with also. also we, we do it when the cells are at issue. So, so I talked about the manipulation of biological cells, which is a micrometer size. We also do nanometer size. We're also curious, can we do something bigger, different spectrum? So we can, can we work on something millimeter size? So we work on C. elegans, which is a you know, model organism, which is very popular because it's, uh, it's uh, transparent. It's, uh, we know exactly where each cell is located. And, uh, so now people do it, they, I mean, a lot of C. elegans studies will require trapping and manipulation of C. elegans. But this process often, you know, damages the C. elegans. So we, we think, hey, uh, if we have technique that does not damage C. elegans, that's great. So what do we do? We use a cruiser's traffic, move it down, move it there, move it down again. We can also stretch it. And, uh, and um, so the, uh, the good thing about this is uh, we torture this little worm for little worm for hours, and after we release the acoustic power, they stay very happy to swim in, so we know that they are, they are happy. And uh, we are now we are also working on rotation of sea elegans. Uh, now, I think we have some ideas on how to rotate in this XY plan, but people want us to rotate this way, mm -hmm. because then, then you can take images at different angles, and because this worm is always swimming, right? So there's no way you can do that without a special technique. But if you can do that, that's, that's good. We still don't know how to do that yet. But we're, uh, we're still trying to figure it out. So, so that's the, as I say, one of the biggest advantage of our technique is non-invasiveness. So we actually did some characterization. We look at the viability, proliferation, and the apoptosis. We compare three different samples, positive control, so on, so on, literally you can see there is, you know, we, we don't see much uh, difference. So this com uh, confirms that the technique is, uh, is biocompatible. We also look at gene level. Uh, and you can see, these some studies we do. Uh, you look at the conventional cell sort, they change, even for HERA cell, they change 13 genes. Ours is zero. So that means, that, I mean, the affecting, you know, the, the, the the disturbance on the gene level is also very, very bad. I, that I, I believe is very important for, uh, for, for people who work on omics uh, studies. So that's the first part of, of my uh, talk. And the second part I will go very quickly. So we are working on, uh, I'll, I'll give two examples. I'll talk about our work on optofluidic micro lenses. And lenses, so now the lenses are usually made of Solid stuff, materials, glass, polymers. Those are great, but the tunability is very limited. So that's why a few years ago, I started to work on 
uh, tunable optofluidic lenses. Basically, we are using fluid to 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 uh, to, to tune it because fluid is a lot more tunable. I talked about the L first. Talk about our first lens. We called L green lens, and that was inspired from. So that's called. A, so basically, uh, that concept was inspired from gradient refractive index lens. Green lens. This is the lens we common, we usually talk about. So it is a refra refractive lens. You have a curved surface, and uh, the light will bend into the middle. And then you also have, so this green lens is, does not have a curved surface. Instead, it has a straight surface. And, but it has a refractive index gradient along this x-axis. So the light will bend gradually into the middle. So this green lens is something in the electrical engineering optics textbook. So it's already been there. It's not something we invented. It's very powerful in optical communication, but the problem is it's not tunable. You basically imply ions into this, into a gas, but once the gradient is formed, you cannot change the gradient. We think, hey, we can to because this work, all you need to have is to have a gradient. We can easily create create gradient in microfluidic environment. Here, we flow two different fluids with two different refractive indexes. And uh, by diffusion, you can form a refractive index gradient. Uh, and the beauty of this, we call this liquid green lens, L green lens. And by changing the flow rate, you can change the refractive index gradient profile. The, therefore, you can change the focal point and other things. So that's, that's the beauty of it. And so, so this work, we did computational fluid mechanics simulation. And to confirm that, we can get a refractive index gradient. And also, by changing the flow rate, we can change the refractive index gradient distribution. And by changing the refractive index gradient distribution, we also did ray tracing simulation. We know that the, the, the focal point will be changed. One thing I have to say that uh, this work, I'm very proud of it, because this work actually is done by a student who has, whose background was biology. You know, biology, most stereotype biology people, we know that they they, they're not that much into math. So, so this student, he realized for his research advice, sorry I said I make fun a lot, but <laughs> I didn't offend that many people. So he, he realized his research is very, uh, to, to understand how fluid mechanics work is very important for him. So they did a, he, so he, he CFD is very important for him. So he actually has the guts to take computational fluid graduate level computational fluid mechanics, which is very difficult. My background was mechanical engineering. Graduate level computational fluid <laughs> mechanics was very difficult for me. No. So he took that course. He did a terrible in that course. <laughs> I think he took a D or something like D or an E or whatever. But it doesn't matter. He really learned the skills to do this. Right? And that, that's, that's, that's uh, on the other hand, I also have a student with mechanical engineering, uh, engineering background. But his research, he took a lot of his plasmonics research. So he realized quantum chemistry is very important mm -hmm. for him. So he took graduate level quantum chemistry course uh, in chemistry department. Again, he did terrible in that mm -hmm. course. But I mean, he, these guys learn, and they, they, they can do something that help with their research. And then they, they, uh, they, they I think mean, that uh, they, the kind of the courage they have, they, I really admire. I, so we first did a simulation. And also we did experiment. You can see once we change the flow rate, we can change the focal point of light. Uh, so this is when you change the flow rate as symmetrically, and when you change the flow rate asymmetrically, you can also change the direction of light. So so this work basically we demonstrate a lens that can not only focus light but also can change the focal point of light and can change direction of light. An article used news describe our work as a microfluidic version of a GLI mask basically <laughs> swing a little later around in a tiny constrained environment, which which at this stage is fun. It's only fun. It's not that useful. But if we can improve the refractive index gradient, if we can really achieve very high numerical aperture, then can be very useful. For example, we could use it in endoscopic laser scanning Hoka microscope. You can create a tiny imaging probe without any moving part. Okay. Then you can all you need to do is to control the flow rate externally. 
then, then you can use that for cancer diagnostics, early, early cancer diagnostics. So that's the uh, second thing I'm going to talk about is plasma fluid events. So we are, in this book, we are marrying uh, plasmonics and optofluidics. Plasmonics basically is uh, surface plasma based nanophotonics and plasmonics and it, uh, so it has the, uh, it, it can manipulate light at sub-wavelength scale. So it, it's not limited by the uh, uh, diffraction limit. So therefore, plasmonics has advantage of, advantages of electronics, which is size, and also has advantages of photonics, which is speed. So that's why in the past 10 years, the research in plasmonics is really uh, hard. And, uh, so now, there are a lot of plasmonic devices, but um, uh, I think one area is relatively limited. So the, the most, most of the plasmonic devices are passive devices, the tun tunable plasmonic devices or reconfigurable plasmonic devices. The one device that has many functions, that aspect is like, so we think, hey, fluidics, maybe we can do something about it. Right? So here, this is our, uh, the, our design. You can see what we do is we use we uh, we shine laser on this on this ghost surface immersed in water and then we create bubble and this bubble uh, uh, by changing the position of the bubble or changing the size of the bubble by changing the shape of the bubble and we can affect because the bubble refractive index is different from the medium and by changing or the size or the shape or the or the or the location you can affect how the surface plasma uh, private can propagate on the substrate. So we, then we can make it tunable, we can make it reconfigurable. Uh, so then that shows when the bubble size is different, we can cause the surface plasma private to, uh, to diverge uh, you know, to a different extent. We can also focus it, we can change the focal point of surface plasma private we can also coordinate it. And as I said, uh, this, this book, this uh, fluid, or this bubble-based device has a lot of flexibility. Uh, this book we show we can change the shape of bubble either by acoustics or by optics. If you can change the shape, then you have a lot of controllability on this surface plasma gravity. So in summary, I give two examples of my lab research. One is acoustic treatments, and we realize many functions. And I really think that three advantages of our device. Number one is, our, since our power intensity consumed by this system is 10 million times smaller than that of other treatments. So it's a lot more non-invasive. It's more, a lot more biocompatible. That is also confirmed by our preliminary results. And our technique is also very, very versatile. We realize many functions using pretty much the same pattern. And uh, we can apply to almost all kinds of biopolymers in almost any medium. We, we can apply to particles in nanometer size all the way to millimeter size. And the device is very compact, simple, and inexpensive. And we also talk about how fluid can be used to change the optical property. We talk about the, we, we control the light in micrometer scale, also in the plasmonic, plasma fluid lens, we control the light propagation in nanometer scale. So I'm very grateful for the uh, students and uh, postdocs in my lab, especially the, the five, the six guys I highlighted here, because they are the guys who did the work I presented today. Other guys are working on other stuff. I, I don't have time to talk. I don't think uh, there is, uh, I mean, this, uh, I'm very grateful for the, the people I'm uh, working with. I, uh, the really a great group of people, and uh, I, uh, I, I only recruit two kinds of people. Uh, group one is the people who are slightly better than me. And group two are people who are a lot better. <laughs> and uh, most of my my guys are, are group, group two people. So uh, also thank my collaborators, my funding agencies. Also want to thank you for staying here on Friday afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Professor Wong? So you talk, you talk about a lot of advantages. So what are the disadvantages? Yeah, of course. Uh, they are always this one. And those are the only secret we know. We don't talk about that. Much. <laughs> but I can have no problem to share with you. So oh, the challenges, yeah. Yeah, challenges. So for example, let me let me talk about the acoustic treaters first, because that's something I 
it's, it's, it's starting with my heart. Right? And uh, the disadvantage is the kind of, the, the, I mean, there are a lot of things we don't understand. Okay. And for the things we understand, for some specific applications, it works really well, but there are a lot of things we also don't understand because somehow the kind of physics we, we know at the interface of acoustics and fluidics is, is much, much less. And so that's why I, I, I'm, I'm very keen to work with people who has a stronger physics background than us uh, to help us because uh, we, uh, we actually, essentially, we don't understand very well how this acoustic wave propagate in the, in the uh, micro, uh, you know, the, in the fluidic environment. Uh, but the, the, the system is very, you know, is because what, once you set up every plant is very reliable. But once you change some parameters, we will always observe something very weird. And we don't know why. And, uh, and we are trying to figure out. And we don't talk about those things in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. So, um, when you get down to the liquid crystal size, what is the mechanism for the line Oh, the mechanism. Um, Again, that again, that's something a lot of things we don't understand. But we think um, probably it's because of acoustic streaming. But we have no, that one. That work we have not uh, done uh, in depth study yet. So the principle of this is based on the standing waves, right? Yes. Um, what's the attitude? You mean the vibration? Yeah. Vibration, nanometer size. Yeah. Compared to, so, so solid devices, a lot of biosensors. You know, people can make biosensors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Structurally, in terms of fabrication, is, is your, are your devices just almost exactly the same as yeah, a lot yeah. of the solid biosensors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we basically, we just use it to a different application. I realize. Too many people being sold. Uh, I, I, I decided not to pass. Yeah. Do you uh, did you link your acoustic uh, device with the acoustic touch screen? The acoustic touch screen. Very yeah. Popular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so so yeah. That I mean. So that's. Uh, but I don't understand your question. So yeah. <laughs> so what is your question? Uh, maybe a lot of fundamentals that we can dig out by. I mean, yes. I think I think the course, the course way of everything that understand understanding is is good. But if you you know, I mean, understanding at the interface of acoustics and fluids, that one is it. Yeah, and that one because before there is not too much need to do that. But for ours, it's very important, and we hope we can we can through our efforts we can understand better than. So when you when you did a two dimensional uh, like a cell like distribution control like X Y and after you uh, like sorted a different spot, how do you extract the sample? How do I what? Extract the sample from the like, sorting. So you use the X Y and you have a spot. The yeah. cell is accumulated. How do how do you extract the cell? How do you take what you out? Yes. What do you sort sort cells? Yes. Once you basically the sort the sort of I talk about is in continuous flow. So then you 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 basically you direct them into different outlets and they will be collected at different outlets.
So, so that's an interesting point. So I was going to ask you about, we, we talked about this fire stuff. Yeah. Just briefly. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, sure. So that um, is very high throughput. So we're that you know, people have done that uh, multiple, multiple millimeters per minute. Yeah. It inherently works it that way. But there's forces in there. And I don't know that anybody looks at how strong the forces are in the cells. Mm -hmm. um, some lysis can occur. Yeah. Um, but maybe even more interestingly, so the point just came up. So those devices, it really needs to be Newtonian fluids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, too many cells, it becomes, starts yeah. to behave like non-Newtonian. Yeah. So the Cousteau fluids, yeah. Newtonian, non-Newtonian requirements, no requirements really? No, no. At, least, at least it works, so far it works very well for non-Newtonian fluid like that. Like mm -hmm. But the behavior is that, I mean, we'll, we'll be studying, you need to adjust some parameters. And, uh, and, uh, but, but it works. Okay, any last questions? All right, let's thank Professor Huang again. Now that we're in the, the Big Ten, this is the standard that we need to live up to. <laughs>